Okay, thanks so much, uh, Professor Westcott, for his uh, great talk. Uh, really interesting stuff, and thanks very much for agreeing to moderate this session and to revise schedule at fairly late notice. That's appreciated. Um, so, the title of this talk is uh, rather grand, um, grandly described as Driving a Green Economy Through Fiscal Policy Reform and Public Finance. So, it's the title of a paper that was commissioned by, by one of the United Nations agencies. And um, the context of the discussion is essentially the following. Um, what is the crisis and the need to recover from the crisis with all the implications for high resource scarcity and um, fiscal deficits? What does that mean for environmental policy? So going forward, how should issues of environmental sustainability be reflected in the macro-fiscal framework? So particularly today, I want to focus on the fiscal. We've heard quite a lot on the macro side, so I really want to focus on the fiscal today. So um, here's a running order. Um, it'll be self-evident, all these materials I understand will be circulated. So um, why a green economy? So a green economy sort of emerged in the policy lexicon around sort of 2007, 2008, um, driven through by the United Nations, but adopted by a number of the international institutions, and now into the frameworks of national policy. Um, so what, why are we interested in this issue? Um, so the evidence on the economic implications of uh, heightened uh, environmental sustainability issues have become plainer and plainer in the last decades. Um, so some examples are cited here. Um, counting fish stocks, particularly in the oceans, is pretty difficult, but some of the best studies available to date suggest that you know, up to one quarter of these fish stocks globally uh, have collapsed in the sense that they can't sustain themselves going forward. Um, land pressures, I mean, they're rising. The, the, the central estimates from the UN are by mid-century for a global population on the order of 9 or 10 billion. I mean, I'm sure we agree this is a lot of people consuming a lot of resources. Um, a study I was quite closely involved in uh, five or six years ago with a Stone Review, where we estimate um, the headline figure was on the order of 5 to 20%. Uh, of GDP. Many of you will have followed that debate and know that there's quite a lot of issues that underlie those numbers, but uh, to a first order approximation we're talking about a serious problem. Okay, so at the same time, uh, in the last five years we've been rocked by the crisis and we're looking for ways to promote structural growth. Um, so what does that mean for, uh, for environmental policy? So green economy is an emerging concept linking economic growth and environmental sustainability. In the paper, it doesn't go into definition, definition, definitional issues in any real detail. Partly that was tactical, I didn't want to get involved in an interagency debate on the matter, um, and partly because this is an unashamedly a view from 10,000 feet, and really uh, this definition needs to be made uh, and refined by national governments, um, reflecting the specific characteristics of, of their countries and their economies and their environmental problems. Um, but nevertheless, I think we're fair to say that what we're talking about are economic opportunities from new green technologies and sectors, uh, productivity opportunities from uh, less resource-intensive plants of production, uh, opportunities to, from reduced uh, policy distortions, and um, the opportunity to avoid environmental impediments to growth. Okay. Right, so a few housekeeping issues. Um, why uh, environmental issues haven't been more at the fore of, of uh, economic policy makers' perspectives and priorities in the past? Um, well, I think part of the reason is because it's difficult. Um, one of the priorities and the, uh, the objectives of uh, IMF tax policy in this, in this field has been to really try and, um, try and link uh, the knowledge and, and awareness and priorities of environmental departments with the expertise and coordination functions of finance. Uh, sorry, I should, I should say I did have some experience with the IMF, so a lot of this is drawn from, from policy developed at that time. Okay, so one of the reasons is, is because it's difficult. So environmental benefits, say bio, uh, heightened biodiversity, say, or reduced air pollution, health effects, not everything's priced in the market, which makes it quite difficult to evaluate what returns you get for any policies towards environmental protection. Um, evaluating policy more generally is difficult. There tends to be a lot of instruments which overlap, 
an impact on the markets you want to evaluate. So unpicking this, the singular effects of an individual intervention is inevitably difficult. We all need to compare something against a baseline which is effectively unobservable. These, these kind of problems are perennial, but um, it's worth giving them a mention up front, I think. Okay, in the case of climate change, it's a particular problem because the costs of action kind of happen now, and the benefits are, for the most part, way into the future, which kind of makes a discount rate, the way that you evaluate uh, the effects tomorrow in present-day terms, critical. Now, a lot of you will have followed the debate following the publication of the Stern Review concerning their choice of discount rates. Now, I don't want to get into it too much. Perhaps we can take it on in discussion if people are interested. But in any case, it's a key point. Uh, the costs are, the, the benefits are extremely sensitive to assumptions on this parameter. Okay, so um, we haven't spoken much about distributional issues uh, so far, and hopefully we can go into it a little bit more today. Uh, some questions were raised from the floor, and I think they were good ones. Um, so, transforming uh, towards transforming our economies to a more greener structure, shall we say, uh, are going to have winners and losers. Um, so, think, understanding what those effects are and finding ways of offsetting the, the implications for the uh, most vulnerable members of society is going to be a key challenge. Um, now, I don't know how many of you have been involved in uh, assessing tax incidents, but it's, it's kind of challenging. For the, for the, in the first place, you need to understand uh, what households uh, consume on an individual basis, and that's not necessarily the same. Um, it, it differs across countries. It, it differs across households. Um, the next question is, uh, over what time horizon are you really thinking about the effects of policy? Um, it's inevitable that technological substitution possibilities will increase over time, um, and yet in the short term, people are going to have very few ways out from, many of these, from the effects of many of these policies. What that means is, in practice, if you choose a, 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 an adjustment in your fiscal framework, let's say, to fully compensate people for the effects of policies in the near term, you may end up overcompensating them and undermining your fiscal base in the longer term. Um, there are many channels for um, the distributional effects of environmental policies. Um, there may be knock-on effects for wages if you're working in a uh, resource-intensive market which gets hit by a tax. Maybe there'll be a knock-on effect for the, for the wage you get paid. Or if you own capital, the same. Equally, uh, the benefits to environmental policies may be unequally distributed, and this is another channel which we may need to consider. So, uh, I think there's no singular con conclusion, but I think it's come to the attention of policymakers, particularly in the last five years, that we're going to need a stronger set of measures by which that we can by which we can use to really manage these kind of interactions and understand progress towards our long-term goals. Uh, I've highlighted two things here, just standard indicators relating to investment, employment and output in key sectors. That's something that policymakers are really familiar with. Something that's a bit more radical, especially for the fiscal and, and, uh, and central banking people, is uh, the idea of green national accounting. So currently, the national accounts, they don't, they don't take account, for example, of changes in the stock of natural resources over time. So it's possible that we may be uh, enjoying levels of consumption that we can't sustain in the long term because we're depleting what's, what's under the soil, for example. So there's a big ploy to really try and strengthen the, the, the array of measures and metrics that are available to policymakers in order to kind of manage policy going forward. Okay, so the, policy, the, the paper makes a big play on the role of fiscal policies. It argues that they're key to robust, efficient, and fair transformation of an economy from a brown base to a green base, if you like. Um, it argues very classically that taxes and charges aimed at getting the prices right are a necessary but not sufficient condition in order to, fa to facilitate this sort of economic transformation. Now, the, the paper goes into quite a lot more detail about other policies that you might want to think about in conjunction with fiscal measures. Uh, for the sake of uh, brevity, if you like, I've kind of excluded those, so I, I'd encourage you to read the paper in more detail if you, uh, if you want to look at this broader scope. Okay, so, uh, what does getting the prices right mean? Well, um, that's pretty tricky. I mean, in broad terms, what I'm saying is that I think we want the economic, environmental and social costs 
of consumption and production choices better reflected in, price, in prices. And to the extent that these aren't captured by the market, maybe policymakers want to intervene a little. Again, there's more on the detail in, in the paper. I kind of love this stuff, so um, I, I said a bit more then, but I'll keep it short now. Um, so, uh, many countries, particularly in the West, they're kind of broke at the moment. Um, so an argument made in this paper is that there are revenues out there to be, to be earned from the implementation of environmental taxes. Um, the current statistic is, is the following, that environmental taxes, however defined, I'll go on to that in a minute, um, raise around 2% of GDP on average across the OECD. Most of that's from motor fuel, motor fuel excises, around 90%, but there are other taxes in there. So that number's actually, in general, falling. Uh, and, 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 and the reason for that is, for the most part, uh, the erosion of the real value of motor fuel excise to, a, to inflation. The uh, excise in the US has not been reset for, I don't know, 15 years probably. Um, okay, um, so one thing's for sure is that the revenue potential from uh, taxing a global public bad like uh, carbon are enormous. They're absolutely huge. Some of the proposals that were going through the US uh, in 2008-2009 uh, suggested revenue on the order of seven, eight hundred billion. And it's a big number in the context of the current fiscal deficit in that country. Okay, so it's not all about taxes. Um, targeted expenditure measures can harness private green, for private green investment. Um, it uh, comes to the awareness of policymakers increasingly in the last few years that uh, public expenditure choices by governments in big ticket uh, infrastructure projects, roads, railways, etc., they really affect the uh, the pollution they, that that occurs from private sector activity. Um, expenditure policies are also about offsetting and redistributing um, income, wealth to those who really can't afford to pay the burden of these sorts of policy reforms. So we'll go into that a little bit more in the next few slides. Um, but the fundamental message of the paper is that there has been, uh, in my view at least, uh, an excessive preference for spending measures over taxes in the, in the past 10 years or so, and that that is not sustainable or necessarily desirable in many cases, especially when you consider the fiscal challenges that many countries now face. Okay, so policy interactions. Um, it may sound like just policy speak, but it really matters, and it's an area that's really been uh, overlooked in this field, I think. So, environmental policies will, will, will interact with existing fiscal measures and with, with wider regulatory policies, for example. So, I don't know, think of, a, think of an energy tax. Um, it's gonna reduce, en reduce your income. But if you've got, a, if you've got a, an income tax already in place, that affects your decisions as to, for example, how much to work, then there's going to be um, an expounding effect from the energy tax transmitted through the income tax. That's a tax interaction effect, and actually it exacerbates the distortions from your existing fiscal framework, and these sorts of things need to be considered. Uh, we had another example from Professor Westcott about measures to reduce oil demand in transportation, being the CAF standards. Um, now, what the CAF standards have in practice done, apart from substitute between classes of vehicles, because their coverage has been, uh, up till quite recently, only partial, has been to essentially reduce the marginal cost of the, of the kilometre or the mile driven. So that in conjunction with falling real value of excise, driving's got cheaper. That's another example of a, a policy interaction, and there are really many. There's a carbon market in Europe at the moment, established since around 2005, and at the same time, the governments have been pouring in money on subsidies, which have essentially been pulling down the price in that market and then therefore undermining the incentive effects. So there are many, many examples, but I would argue that in general, policymakers have been somewhat poor in their record in considering these sorts of interactions. Okay, so uh, what is an environmental tax? Well, I would argue that actually, the, for the most part, there's no such thing. Taxes are inevitably uh, designed with revenues in mind. But that said, um, there are a taxonomy of, uh, of taxes, if you like, that bear on environmental sustainability. And I've got a few up here. 
So we have taxes on environmentally damaging products, fossil fuel excises, particularly gasoline. We have taxes on uh, natural resource extraction, royalties, for example, on minerals, oil and gas. Um, I mean, in many sense, they're a fundamental tax base for many, many resource-rich countries around the world. Uh, so these are not marginal, these are not marginal tax issues. Um, we've got taxes on harmful byproducts of consumption and production. We had a Montreal Treaty back in the 90s, which was implemented uh, across a number of countries, which led to charges on sulfur and nitrous oxides. But we shouldn't think of these sorts of taxes as purely uh, Western country measures. Increasingly, uh, developing countries uh, seeing problems of pollution in their, in, in their countries, particularly in urban areas, are implementing more and more of these taxes. Um, so this is something of a trend that we're seeing globally. Um, we can also think about um, environment, environmental charges on basic services, water, electricity, um, and, and sanitation, for example. Now these are services that typically have quite a heavy environmental footprint, and decisions over cost recovery for what are often publicly delivered services, uh, have a key bearing. Okay, so what have these sorts of measures done in practical terms? Well, it's quite difficult to tell for the most part because people haven't gone out and studied it. So as a call to a bunch of young researchers, that's great. There's plenty of opportunities to come and help policymakers find out uh, what's been going on and to make the better decisions going forward. Um, but I'll give you one example here. There were a bunch of energy tax reforms, for example, in Germany, Denmark, and Sweden during the 1990s. And best estimates by UK researchers are that these uh, measures reduce greenhouse gases, for example, by on the, on the order of 2 to 6% over a decadal period. So, I mean, that's pretty good, right? Okay, but one thing that is clear from the, the policy literature. Am I on the right side? Okay, the one thing that is clear from the policy literature is that the effectiveness of these measures has been systematically undermined by exemptions to the base and by rate reductions, particularly made to, um, to trade-exposed industries. So, in some sense, policymakers have gone to the fence, but then they've shied away. And the reason is, for the most part, they're concerned about adverse impacts for the competitiveness of their industries which is fair enough, and we'll talk about possible solutions to that in the future, but it's certainly a bit of a hang-up in terms of policy implementation so far. Okay, I mean, a basic point, it's almost trivial, but it's worth making. Um, the effect of a tax depends on how you spend the money. Um, so there are some quite innovative and, and ambitious examples of revenue recycling. So Germany, for example, shifted <coughs> revenues to the equivalent of about 3% of GDP away from environmentally harmful products, away from um, standard uh, forms of expenditure, for example, on social security, and on to uh, environmentally harmful goods and services, in particular energy. Okay, um, another kind of uh, ticking off for policymakers, at least from my perspective, has been the extent of earmarking uh, observed in the context of um, environmental taxes. So an earmark is where you implement a tax and then you allocate the resources to a particular objective. Now, some of you may think that's perfectly reasonable, but... I'm getting told off. Okay. Um, some of you may think that's perfectly reasonable, but a lot of the budget guys find that quite unhelpful because it means that there's rigidities in the budget. There's walls that you have to get around when you have needs that differ from the commitments that were made previously. Okay, so... Um, I said that this is unashamedly a view from 10,000 feet, so it's a degree of generality that some of you may find unsatisfactory, and I do myself, so perhaps we can get more specific in the discussion. Um, so some green tax reform priorities. Um, what should we be looking to do in the next decade or so? Well, more rational taxation of fossil fuels is clearly a priority. Removal of, uh, of, of excise exemptions seems an obvious choice. Coal is systematically untaxed around the world, it's a bad guy in terms of pollution, so it makes sense probably to try and tackle this one. Um, Systemising rates to reflect the environmental and social harm, that seems like another kind of no-brainer in some sense. Um, some examples might mean uh, removing the preferential treatment of diesel, which uh, emits quite environmentally harmful particulates, 
And with the exception of the US and the UK, it's very generally um, much cheaper than petrol, for example. So, so removing this kind of preferential treatment might make sense. So getting the prices right may have quite broad tax reform implications. So environmentally harmful products are very often uh, not subject to VAT um, or are subject to reduce rates of VAT. So in terms of tax reform, perhaps extending the VAT and reducing these preferential rates may make a sensible precursor, in fact, to many uh, environmental excise reforms. Um, this next point is kind of really with uh, um, advanced countries in mind, at least in the first instance, but essentially as technology improves, the opportunities for a more fundamental restructuring of exercises, for example in transportation, um, may, may, may occur. So um, Professor Westcott spoke of congestion charging in London, I believe they have it now in Milan also. Um, so there may be opportunities to really target with your fiscal framework much more precisely the environmental costs. So we're all concerned, or many of us are concerned with such global issues as climate change, but the best evidence that we have available is that climate change in terms of its magnitude is quite small relative to other environmental and social costs. Accident risk, congestion, time waiting in queues and the like may in fact be a much more serious, uh, might, may impose much more serious costs than, cli than climate change, at least in the short term. And with that in mind, it may be, it may be possible to implement such uh, time of day user charges to really target um, these costs in a much more effective way. The link between fuel use and congestion is, is quite imperfect, if you think about it. It really depends on where you drive and when you drive. Okay, so there's a, set, there's a set of points here on carbon markets and their development. We're seeing these grow up like mushrooms around the world. We've got a, an emissions trading scheme in Europe. We've got a new carbon tax in Australia. Many developing countries are beginning to implement these, these, these taxes. There's one in Mauritius. Uh, Costa Rica has had one since the 1990s, I believe. Um, but there's plenty more we can do. Um, so through the crisis, we saw extreme volatility in these carbon markets. Prices dropped, peaked to trough on the order of 70, 80%, I believe. So while it's nice to see an adjustment in prices through the cycle, probably this is too much. So we need measures to really um, increase the liquidity and depth of these markets in order to remove some of these vol volatility issues. <laughs> Um, many markets are just simply not uh, subject to financial incentives. One big one is tropical deforestation. Probably accounts for on the order of 20% of our global emissions, and, uh, and the cost of avoiding some of these problems may be somewhat lower than in energy markets. So from an economist's perspective, it probably makes sense to try and tackle this with a system of financial incentives to avoid, um, to avoid deforestation rates that we currently observe. Um, international aviation and shipping is a, a two other big sectors, big polluters and currently completely exempt from any forms of taxation. Now, there are huge uh, issues of institutional reform, etc., that may bear on, on an effective charging regime for these kind of bunker fuels, as they're called. But nevertheless, this isn't a reason not to try. And in the meantime, there may be sort of second best tax policy measures which we might look to implement. For example, currently ticket taxes, cargo taxes, are typically user charges. They're designed to pay for the running costs of a port or an airport. But we might look to reform these to actually operate in a, in a, more bro in a broader fashion. Okay, the other, the, other, the other kind of housekeeping point really relates to um, the dissipation of the revenues. So currently there's uh, emissions charging in Europe, as I've said, but the rights to pollute are, for the most part, given away to, from governments to producers. Now, from an administrative perspective, it's hard work. You've got to find out what individual installations actually need, and if you get it wrong, then you've got excess supply in the market, which is, in fact, what happened. What you're missing out on is big bucks, and big bucks from a relatively efficient tax base. Uh, the current plans of allocation in the EU currently diffuse about 20, 30 billion euro a year, which is quite a big number. Okay, so um, I identified one problem, which was the fact that tax incidence often falls on trade-exposed um, industries, and governments are loath to impose costs on these, on these companies and industries because they fear for their future tax base. Um, so um, we need some coordination, it's clear. Um, 
there's been a lot of discussion around this um, among tax theorists and, and practitioners. Now, my view is personally that we should look to coordinate around minimum rates. It's more flexible than harmonization, this idea that we should charge universally the same charge uh, across countries. And, and, but, and it sort of protects countries that want to go a bit harder, a bit faster, charge more aggressively from uh, cheaters, if you like. Charge, uh, countries that charge too low. So it, I think this, this, this approach has been adopted in Europe, coordination on minimum, on minimum excise rates, and I think it's perhaps a model we should consider trying to roll out more broadly. Okay, so, there's a, so taxation of uh, natural resource rents is a big deal in resource-rich countries, and um, Professor Westcott alluded to uh, efforts to reclaim a greater proportion of the value of these, um, of these resources as their prices rose through the 2000s. Now, that's quite difficult for investors to see the terms of fiscal frameworks changed midway through an investment cycle. It undermines trust and it's no good for the future. So I think a challenge here is to really find design fiscal frameworks in a way which are flexible and progressive in prices so that when prices rise, the, the, the government take rises, and when prices fall, the government take falls. So um, there are many ways of doing this. If you're interested in this issue, as I am, I'd encourage you to look at a book published by IMF colleagues in 2010 on this topic, Keane, McPherson, and Daniel, um, which really looks in some detail about how you can use taxes for these ends. Okay, so one theme of the, po of, of the paper is really the need for investment in tax administration. Um, so, believe it or not, there are a lot of developing countries out there interested in reform in this area. And many times we've been asked to help the development process, and the scale of ambition is great. They really want to implement targeted downstream measures on pollution in water, in air, all sorts of things. But the institutional frameworks are often not there, such that if they're, if they're imposed in legislation, they can't be really implemented. So, I really think that, um, that investment in this field is really important. It means investing in your revenue administration, in your customs, in your environment agencies, sensible choices on separation of responsibilities for monitoring and revenue collection, etc. There's much more detail in the paper, but I definitely encourage you to, to, to think carefully about this issue if you're interested in it yourself. Okay, so um, this is something of a legacy slide, actually, but. The motivation for this paper actually came through a sister paper, and, 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 and that was really related to the issue of fiscal coordination for stimulus packages. Um, so the IMF was quite heavily involved in coordinating advice and experience between countries as, they, as countries attempted to stimulate, stimulate the economy through, through fiscal expansion. So, I mean, it's worth observing that environmental themes were quite prominent in this context, roughly 15% of stimulus across the G20 um, was allocated to broadly defined uh, climate related investment themes, so energy efficiency, building programs, uh, vehicle scrappage schemes, all sorts of things. Um, I haven't referenced the other paper, but I, I, I may well do. Um, you can find more information there. Um, but I think we should um, maybe be careful before being too optimistic about what we saw. Much of the stimulus programs, particularly in China and other countries, was, um, was notably dirty, classically in capital intensive, resource intensive investment, road infrastructure, etc. Um, so perhaps we should be cautious before being too, um, too positive around the, the, the balance of these programs, at least from an environmental perspective. Um, there, hasn't, there, there hasn't, to this date, at least to my knowledge, been any rigorous ex post analysis on the employment effects of these environmental stimulus programs. But I think, at least from a perspective of microeconomic theory, a preference, uh, I would express a preference for measures which uh, lower prices rather than raise them. So energy efficiency, for example, rather than renewables. Um, and for labor intensive programs. And in that context, there's quite a difference between the, te between the particular environmental technologies. So something like building in insulation or, or biomass or solar thermal might be considerably more labor intensive to implement and thus uh, 
uh, uh, perhaps a more preferable um, stimulus program than, say, solar PV, which is quite capital intensive. But these are, these are fairly obvious points. Um, from a practical perspective, uh, it, it was quite difficult to see what was going on within the budgets of countries because this, these were rapidly changing times. Um, but it's clear that there were fairly substantial disbursement problems in environmental as with other programs. Um, evidence from the US, which tends to be the most transparent of countries, is that the energy efficiency programs were, uh, the monies for those programs were dispersed more effectively than for renewables again. Okay, so on to the uh, longer term stuff for subsidy reform. For, for subsidy reform. So the magnitude of green subsidies is quite unclear, but it's likely to be large. So an example cited here is that support to biofuels uh, is estimated around $11 billion in 2006, and that number is rising fast until around 2010, certainly. Um, the cost effectiveness of many such programs, um, as with taxes, uh, is largely unevaluated, but it's likely that these have been substantially weakened by difficulties of targeting financial support to those who need it. So a couple of studies here are cited which I think kind of tell something of a story. So Alex Faff at Duke looks at uh, financial incentives for deforestation in, um, in Costa Rica, and he finds that the effect of these programs, which were actually quite large in budgetary terms, were almost negligible, because the, the monies flowed to, uh, to landowners, um, which, to owners of land which were not subject to clearance risks. So these were remote lands away from the, from the transportation infrastructure that wouldn't, have been, that wouldn't have been cleared anyway. So from a, a fiscal perspective, it's kind of a waste of time. Um, this uh, presentation was given right in front of the guy who designed it, so that was quite amusing. Um, okay, so another age-old study which is, off, which is often cited, this guy uh, by Paul Josko and Marin in 1992, which studies energy efficiency programs in the US, and they find a free rider race, by which I mean investments that would, that, financial support that went to investors, which would have made the investments anyway, was on the order of 50%. So that's kind of a pretty high wastage rate, you know? Okay, so here's an, institu an institutional view of the IMF, and it's not unsupported by evidence, is that it may be easier to direct uh, private investment choices um, through direct intervention in research and development. I mean, these sorts, of, these sorts of budget line items, they are subject to rent seeking and the risk of inefficient divestment, but on balance, they may be somewhat less than measures such as tax incentives and the like, which I've just discussed. Um, so, uh, Professor Westcott mentioned um, research and development himself. I mean, it's probably worth noting that around the world, uh, the energy component of R&D uh, around the world has tanked until quite recently, and that the composition of that, those R&D budgets has, for the most part, been dominated by nuclear. So I think it's probably worth considering amid, amid our policy recommendations, if you like, a, a reversal of that trend and a shift in, its con in the composition of energy-related R&D towards green technologies, energy storage, energy efficiency, and the like. Okay, so now on to the bad guys, um, the real bad guys at least. So subsidies um, are fueling unsustainable economic activity, big time. Support to fossil fuels, for example, is, was estimated at around 550 billion in major developing countries in 2008. So that number varies because it depends on the reference price for energy, but I think we can all agree it's a big number. And the OECD in 2010 estimated that um, global ge greenhouse gas emissions, as a consequence of these subsidies, were elevated by on the order of 5 to 10 percent. So that's also a big number. Okay, so another thing. These subsidies are motivated by the desire to sustain incomes of poor people and improve the export competitiveness of many industries. Right, well, I'm not sure they're actually working. So again, evidence by the IMF uh, colleagues in the expenditure department are quite categorical that most of these benefits flow to the people who least need it. So a study of five countries shows that over 80% of the benefits from fuel subsidies commonly go to the top three income quintiles. So these policies are not doing what they were intended to do. They're kind of legacy issues and they really need um, a clear lens over them. So 
energy services, uh, basic services. For the most part, across many developing countries, these are provided below cost of service. Now, it's intuitive why these are done. No one wants to impoverish uh, the most vulnerable members of society. But there are serious environmental... Can I have five? No, I feel we have to have the question part. Like, we, we have to go to the lunch at half past. I'm hungry too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to finish the point because it's important, if that's okay. Um, so, we need to move towards cost of service provision. Who are these measures actually helping? In many developing countries, the people who are poorest at the bottom end of the income scale, they don't even have access to these subsidies. And we need to distinguish also with quality issues. Intermittent electricity supply is a phenomenon across many developing countries, and the economic costs of these patterns are huge. So offsetting them means more investment. And more investment costs money, and those monies need to be recouped ultimately from the general budget or from the, users, or from the user prices. So we need to think carefully about this. So how do we do this in a way that doesn't, um, doesn't hurt the people who need it most? Well, that's, that's difficult, but the, but the paper really places a challenge to, to policymakers. These general market-wide subsidies, they're, they're tough, they're expensive, and they don't always work. So we really need to think more innovatively about the way we use the expenditure framework to compensate people who can't afford to pay the cost of higher prices. And that may mean schemes such as conditional cash transfers, which have become increasingly popular among, uh, among public finance people in recent years. And these have certainly been used in conjunction with subsidy reforms, for example, in Indonesia, uh, quite successfully. So it's a call to policymakers to do, to do better in some sense. Okay, so conclusions. I've overrun, but they're, they're here for you to see on this slide. I think there are real opportunities from green growth and environmentally sustainable uh, job creation and, th and that this should be a real macroeconomic priority over the next decade. Fiscal policies are really core to a coordinated strategy to realise these opportunities, being fundamental to the nature of incentives faced by households and firms. Um, in general, fiscal treatment of environmentally harmful uh, uh, products, services and natural resources uh, are too favourable. There are opportunities to systemise the existing, re existing regimes uh, and the reform of environmentally harmful subsidies, including to fossil fuels, pesticide subsidies and the like, really should be a key priority. Removing these policy distortions represents a real opportunity. Okay, but it would, it's probably worth noting that the information available to policymakers relating to subsidy for reform is remarkably poor, especially considering um, what an important issue it is. So as researchers, uh, if you're looking for a topic for your thesis, um, this kind of stuff is, is, is a great topic to choose. Okay, thanks very much.